begin with a word of apology. Uh, as you can hear, for some of you who were here a few days ago, I seem to have misplaced my voice. Um, and I've, but I have picked up something I can use in the meantime. And uh, hopefully this will do, uh, if you can hear me, please. Um, if you can suffer through my cracked voice, uh, I think we'll be fine this morning. <laughs> I, I wish there was a GPS for finding one's voice. Um, but also, I want to, after that apology, just also um, express my, my gratitude for already this, what we've uh, been offered this morning. I think uh, our time of uh, worship and reflection uh, was just amazing. I've been blessed by that. And then, of course, uh, a meditation on the word and a challenge, really, uh, an ethical summons, I believe, that is just so necessary for our times. The way we find ourselves, I believe there's so many voices that are competing for our ethical loyalty. But it's good to know that in a world that is uh, so crowded, really, with so, so noisy, telling us to do different things, that the voice of God is sure and is certain in us, powered by his word, of course, to lead us in the right direction. Uh, the scripture that uh, Maruti shared is something that I've, I've held dear in my heart, um, and it actually has led me to memorize quite a bit of scripture, you know, because I truly believe that I have hidden your word in my heart so that I may not sin against you. It's such a, it's such a powerful reminder for our times. I want to uh, speak very briefly about uh, Maruti you had about seven or eight conclusions. I have about four introductions <laughs> to complement those. So, so <laughs> he, he's, he's mentoring me uh, really well already. But I, what I want to speak to us about uh, this morning is on this uh, topic, catching up and leading the other way. Catching up, leading the other way. What I have in mind when I speak about Catching up is two images, uh, really. The first one is an image of, if you think about weather, uh, imagine a, a hurricane of sorts. Imagine that there's a lot of chaos and there's a lot of uh, turbulence, there's a lot of wind, there's a lot of uh, 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 noise. However, in the still point, uh, in the center, there is this place that is peaceful. Peaceful. There is this still point. And I think when we think about leadership in this world, there's a lot of questions that we must be asking ourselves. What do we mean? Who are we trying to lead? Where are we trying to lead them to? Are we talking politics? Are we talking Christians or non-Christians? Are we talking particular spheres of influence? Are we talking about particular spheres within our cultural landscape? But it is already so crowded. It is already so polluted. <clears throat> there is already so much noise. We need a place, a still point. And for us Christians, that is the person of Christ. Where we can go and be gathered. Where we can go and actually find peace and a clarity of heart and mind. Where we can go and find the stillness that then gives us a charge to go and lead. The second picture, the second image, when we say catching up, is that having connected with Christ, then we find that he is already leading. You see, we're not starting. There, there, there is no such a thing, I think, as a complete leadership vacuum. Christ is always leading. He's not standing still. If you read in uh, the book of Acts, Luke, who wrote uh, the book of Acts and writes the Acts of the Apostles, begins Acts by saying something very interesting. In the previous book, referring to the Gospel in Acts, it says, in the previous book, I wrote about the things that Jesus began to teach and to do. That's what he said. This is the account in, in, in the book of Luke. This is what Jesus began to teach and to do. There is implied in his statement as he writes the Acts of the Apostles that now I'm going to tell you 
after his resurrection, this is what Jesus continued to teach and continued to do. And he has in mind that the teaching and the presence or the actions of Jesus are now continued or carried by the church through the power of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus began to act, to teach and to do. Now this is what, how Jesus continued through the church to teach and to do. There is a charge that comes from understanding that Christ himself is leading and we need to catch up with him. We need to keep in step with him and in pace with him. We need to align. We're not here to invent God's plan for the world. Some of us sometimes think we do because sometimes the way the gospel is also emphasized is very individualistic and too narrow. We, we understand, and beautifully so, God has a wonderful plan for my life. But let me say this, the gospel is so much more, it cannot be reduced to a wonderful plan for my life. God has a wonderful plan for the cosmos. Your life is part of that, but God has a wonderful plan for the cosmos. It's liberating, it's freeing, because what we understand by that is that, here's the thing, God is not surprised by the state of our world today. If salvation, according to Ephesians, was something he planned and made provision for before the foundation of the world, then anything that we are trying to do or think about what is good for our culture, our society, our country, our communities, these are small compared to the plan of salvation that God thought about and made provision for in his son before the foundation of the world. So there's a catching up that we need to do to catch up with what's on his heart, what's on his mind, what, is, what are his activities in the world today so that we can keep in step, in pace with him. Right? We're not here to advise God because God somehow is improvising. God is not improvising. He's not caught off guard. We are reading election results and going, okay, what, what, what do they mean? What does this mean for our country? God is not doing that. God knows and has a plan and has made provision and invites us to be co-creators, or let me say this, to be co-missioners with him in his world already. So that we need to catch up in that sense. Then catching up, leading the other way. Why the other way? Well, here's the thing. I told you, I don't believe there's a leadership vacuum, really. There is always someone leading. We just have to ask who and where are they leading to. When, you know, uh, Nietzsche declared and a lot of society said God is dead and certain societies began to live as though God is dead, it's not that there was no one then who took his throne. There was somebody who had to take his throne. Man did. In many societies in the world today, by saying God is no longer in charge, we no longer recognize him, there's a vacuum that needs to be filled and man fills it and then begins to lead in his own way. The turmoil today that we see is this tussle uh, that began right in the Garden of Eden. God said, I will be God and I will tell you uh, what the ethical framework for morality is. Man said, I want that for myself, right? I, I want to make those decisions for myself. I want to choose my own moral framework. And man decided to replace God and go his own way. And this tussle has continued. Who will be God or who will play God in our society today? It's a tussle. So leading the other way is, 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 a, is a call to say, let's recognize that there are leading voices, they are leading personalities, they are leading spirit. Chaos, for instance, is one of those that's leading. And we, having caught up with Christ and his leadership, we've got to then say, how do we lead 
the other way. When Daniel arrives on the scene, there is a leader already on the scene. There are kings on the scene. When Joseph, right, leads, he finds their leaders. Even, in fact, when he, is, he enters uh, what you call um, uh, Potiphar's, wife, uh, Potiphar's uh, house, right, there is a leader in that household. When he goes to prison, there is a leader that he finds there. When he comes out of prison, there is a leader of an entire nation. And God's leadership in him is exercised in all those places where there is a leadership, but that's leading the other way. Right? His, Joseph's story is that he was a successful slave. Have you ever wondered what that, that, that could be like? He was a successful slave. Read it. Right? In prison, he was a successful prisoner. And of course, uh, then later on, went on to become a really powerful man, uh, leading alongside Pharaoh and even leading Pharaoh as well. In the book of Daniel, you have a king that takes the articles uh, from God's temple and then later uses them for a party. He takes what is sacred and treats it as though it is common. Today, we are seeing things that are sacred being treated as being common. Our values are exactly that. It's a commentary on today's warped values, right? The value of human life, something that is sacred, ontologically connected to the very personhood of God. That's, by the way, that's why, why life is sacred, because people are created in the image of God. Right, the Constitution, our Constitution, and many of our debates and arguments just assume that people have inherent dignity and worth. But where does that come from? Right? The Bible offers at least this answer that life is precious. Human beings have dignity because they've been created in the image of God. You remove God, you lose this concept of dignity. You lose this concept of inherent worth. Worth is something outside of God. It's something then therefore becomes, a, it's based on utility, right? How useful you are to me, how useful people find you, that's what your worth is. And if they don't think you are worthy of anything, then you're useless. But by anchoring, anchoring worth in God, it's not something that anyone can take away. It's in design. But you see that which is sacred being treated as though it is common. In Daniel again, you see another king who makes a statue okay, in his image and then wants people to worship this. He takes something which is common and he treats it as something which is sacred. Today, we see the very same thing where things that are supposed to be common are being treated as things which are meant to be sacred. Try saying something about the value of human life, unborn life. And you'll see what I'm talking about when I say that which is sacred being treated as that which is common. Try and say something about political leaders. Criticize a political leader, and you'll see what I mean when I say something which is meant to be common, being treated as something that is actually, or like something that is sacred. Leading the other way means we've got to be ready to engage in a world whose values are switched. And ask God, God, how am I going to turn them around so that I can lead the other way? Who better to teach us this than our Lord Jesus Christ? And so today, I'd like us to reflect on a portion of scripture that you know very well. You've heard it maybe preached many times. But I want us with this framework of catching up, leading the other way with Christ as our supreme example. 
look at how he did it, even in his everyday encounter, very simple encounter with people. And that account, I'd like to ask you to, to, to turn to Luke chapter 10, verse 25, as we reflect on this. And behold, a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, to put him to the test, saying, teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? Let me stop there. Because those two, those two verses, this, it's, it's so rich already. Or in that one verse, as, as, uh, two verses, yeah. It, it's so rich with, with some lessons on leadership. Some of your versions may say an expert in the law. Okay, a lawyer. An expert in the law comes to Jesus. And he's coming to ask him a question. His motives are wrong. His question is wrong. Why, why do I say his motives is wrong? Because it says that he's come to test, he's come to test Jesus. So his quest is not really, his question is not a quest, right? An honest quest for knowledge. He's not saying, I recognize that you know more than I do, more than me, and I'd like you to teach me, enlighten me, open this up for me, give me new information. No, in fact, this is the attitude Jesus had to deal with a lot from the Pharisees uh, and others, the religious leaders. They often treated him like this. You know what, Jesus, you may be, you may be somewhat important when you are with those people out there who are uneducated, uh, with those people who don't really know the law. And now that you are in our company, a company of experts, we're going to show what a fraud you really are. We're going to show that actually your, your importance is only relevant out there to the people who don't matter. But in here, in our presence, in our circles, the people who really know, we're going to expose you and show you, and show you for what you really are. In Luke 7, when Simon the Pharisee invites him to his home, this is his intention. This is exactly what he does. And that's why he, he, he insults him. That's the other point, is that Jesus was often insulted in public. And you have to just understand the cultural uh, context to see the insult um, or the insults that Jesus often had to deal with. And you know, his response was always the same. In fact, even in his parables, he always had someone who showed this response, which he embodies which was this, when he was being offered insults and offense instead of the natural reaction to give back anger and revenge, he processed this and he gives out grace. <coughs> Processing always insult and offense and giving out grace. This is what it was, it was like. So the, the expert in, in law comes to him to test him. Jesus sees this, all right? Jesus had a way of reading people's private emails. Okay, a lot of the times Jesus knew the attitudes of people's hearts. But therein lies an important lesson. God, can you make us a discerning people? As people in the media, can you make us a discerning people so that the narratives that we are always dealing with, the culture, the people that we are always communicating to, can you give us discerning hearts so that we can know, so that we can see past the noise and the busyness and the cutting edge and the trends. Give us insight into understanding the spirit of our times. Jesus knew what this man is doing. He knows his motivation. His motivation is wrong. His question is wrong. What must I do to inherit eternal life? You don't do to inherit eternal life. You become to inherit. Inheritance, that's how it works. It's based on who you are. That's why later on, 
We heard about Paul. Later on, Paul will stress that the good news of Jesus Christ is that God has made provision for those who are not part of the family to be adopted. In Christ, they're adopted, and therefore, they inherit every blessing in Christ. That's why it's such an important question. You, you become, you become grafted in. It's the work that is done that changes who you are. Not what can I do. But what is interesting is then Jesus' response to, to him. Wrong motive, wrong question. Jesus meets him where he is. Jesus says, okay, I hear your question. I have one of my own. I have my own question. What is written in the law? How do you read it? This is very important because he's saying, you come to me as an expert in the law. I'm going to talk to you about the law. Right? You have a look at how the way Jesus responds to different people. Jesus met people where they were at. He didn't expect them to translate themselves into his world and to understand the things he understands so that he can communicate his message to them. No. He translated himself always into their context because he's going to take this man on a journey. He's going to lead him. But his starting point is, where you at? You're an expert in the law. Let's talk about the law then. What is written in the law? How do you read it? Oh, what an important question. How do you read it? It's not, Jesus is not saying, educate me, O oh, expert of the law, on what the law says. No, I'm interested in how do you read it. But I can actually flip that question around. It's not so much how do you read it, so much so as how does the law read you? You see, here's the thing. Uh, I, used to, um, my, I used to have a pastor who used to say, whenever we open the word of God, the word of God opens us. Uh, such an important point because your reflection on the word sometimes tells me more about you than it does about the word. Right? I deal with, I told you, I speak to a lot of non-Christians. And I'm interested in knowing what they think about the Bible because it tells me a lot about them. It doesn't teach me about the Bible. It teaches me about them so that I can meet them where they're at. Uh, we're media people here, so let me use a media example. Uh, when, when the movie Noah came out, right, uh, a lot of people were upset that the movie does not accurately portray the biblical narrative about Noah. When uh, the movie uh, um, about the Exodus came out, a lot of people were watching out for that. How's Hollywood telling our story? You know, how's Hollywood, how's Hollywood uh, uh, reading our text? I was saying, hey, look, as somebody who speaks to a lot of non-Christians, this is really helpful for me. I'm not watching Noah to learn what's in the Bible. I've got a Bible for that. I've got the Holy Spirit for that. I've got men and women who teach powerfully about that. I am watching this movie to find out what is Pharaoh dreaming about. When Joseph, right, comes on, this was his opportunity for leadership. The point of connection was Pharaoh's dreams. God had given Pharaoh dreams, and he didn't understand them. And God then uses Joseph to give clarity. I looked, I said, well, in Hollywood, Pharaoh is dreaming, and he's telling us his dreams. And we need men and women who have the power of discernment from God to interpret them and give God's word to Pharaoh. So I'm not offended 
when somebody is misreading the scriptures because that is not telling me about what God is actually saying. That's telling me the state of their heart. And often we, we miss those cues. Okay, for instance, in, in the movie The Exodus, there's this powerful moment when the, he, uh, the Egyptian uh, sons have just been killed. Or they, they wake up in the morning and everybody finds these firstborn sons dead. And so Pharaoh is holding his son. He's in pain, he's weeping, he's in grief. And he approaches Moses and he asks Moses this question. Is this the kind of God that you serve? The one who would strike down little children to make a point? This is a question he asks him. And I remember, because this is a question I get asked a lot, right? As somebody who is in evangelism and apologetics, this is a question I get asked a lot. And so I, I, I lean in to think, oh my, this is a wonderful opportunity to give a response back. I was disappointed with the response. In the, in the movie, Moses takes out his hand, puts it over uh, Pharaoh's shoulder, and he says, but Pharaoh, only the Egyptian sons or children died, not the Hebrews. And that point is left in tension. If we watch this movie going, man, this is what's bothering Pharaoh in the world today. Because Pharaoh is looking at the world of suffering and is going, I see the, the wars, I see the pain, I see the disease, I see the chaos, the political, economic chaos. Is this all there is? We are, as Christians, looking at the world <laughs> and maybe being tempted to doubt, looking at the very same thing. Is this all there, maybe, Maybe this is all there is. But if there's a temptation for the believer and the non-believer alike, then we should ask ourselves, what is the word that we should be proclaiming right now? How should we be leading right now? Let's get back into, into the text. Told you, those two verses are actually action-packed. He said to him, what is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor is yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. Verse 29, this is such an important one. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, who is my neighbor? So the, the, the expert in the law says, well, Jesus, uh, that's a simple question. What's written in the law is that you should love God with everything and then love your neighbor as yourself. Love God with everything, love your neighbor as yourself. This is, this is a summary of the law. Jesus, you've answered correctly. Go and do it and you will live. There's a sting in, what, in, in, the, in, the, in the way Jesus says this because clearly he's not satisfied. He's asked the question, what must I do Jesus says, well, what's written in law? How do you read it? Love God, love people, and you're in. You're in. You go to heaven if you do this. But obviously, he feels this is a standard he cannot meet. That's why he wants to justify himself. He's been given a standard that he cannot meet. And so he, desiring to justify himself, asks the question, who's my neighbor? I find it very interesting that He's given a standard that has got two parts. Love God with everything. Love your neighbor as yourself. But he feels that only the, the second part is what he can't live up to. Oh, this is, this is a problem we have today. You see, God I can love. I have no issues with God. It's just people. <laughs> God, it's easy. God is easy. Uh, my, my, how, how's your walk with God? It's amazing. I'm having the best quiet times when I just open scripture, just revelation flows. I just sense his presence all the time. But people, oh my goodness. <laughs> Do you know that's not a scriptural <laughs> distinction? If you're struggling to love people, you're struggling to love God. 
It's a mirror. Your relationship with people, I'm not talking about their reaction, I'm talking about your attitude towards people, is a mirror. Just as the word is a mirror to us, right? Attaching it to the previous point about when people read scripture, it's a mirror. James says when we read it, we see our true form. The scripture is not only the word of God to us, but it's also a mirror to give us a picture of our true condition and state. Our relationships, our attitude towards people, this is a mirror about our relationship or the picture, the portrait of our relationship with God. That's why Jesus says, look, you, you're about to give a sacrifice to God, and then there's, you remember there's something I have against my brother, against my sister, leave the sacrifice there, and then go and sort it out. I used to struggle with that because I used to think what that means is God is saying, or Jesus is saying, I need to put God on pause and then go work it out with my brother. How does that work? Prioritize something that's less? No. The idea is this. I don't, I think I'm leaving God at the altar to go and sort it out with my brother, but Jesus is having this idea that when I go to my brother, there I find God. That there I find God. This distinction is not there. But anyway, the, the lawyer makes the distinction. He says, okay, God, I have no problem with my neighbor, but so I need to just be clear. Who are we talking about? Who qualifies? And his question is, who is my neighbor? Who qualifies to be my neighbor? And then Jesus tells a story that we know is a story of the good Samaritan, right? There's somebody who's walking, presumably a Jew or a Jewish man, and he falls in the way of robbers. They rob him, they strip him, they beat him, and then they leave him to die. Then those who belong to the religious establishment, those who are expected to help the Levite, the priest, they come along and they just keep on walking. But the one who is not expected to help, the Samaritan, comes along and then he actually attends to him, puts him on his own donkey, takes him to the inn, spends the night uh, with him, attending to his wounds, and then says to the innkeeper in the morning, listen, here's money, and here's my credit card, just in case there are extra expenses that he will incur. Okay. Now, there are different players. There's the robber, uh, there are the, uh, there's, there, there's, well, there are the robbers, there's the victim, there are those who belong to the religious establishment, there's... Uh, the one who is not expected to help, who helps, is the innkeeper. One of the interesting conversations we need to have in South Africa is, who are you in the story? Right? Who are you in the story? Now, I don't know about you, but I sometimes, in response to this, uh, this morning's word and devotion to us, I find that I play different roles. Sometimes I am the robber. Sometimes I'm a victim. Right, I'm in traffic, someone shouts some racist things, I'm a victim. However, sometimes I see a wrong being done and I don't do anything about it. I'm the Levite and the priest. Right? Or if you're in business, right, and you see there's a colleague who's being promoted, uh, you are being promoted, and a colleague, you know very well that your colleague who's been there was meant to be pro uh, promoted, but it's just for some unfair or unjust thing. This is what's going on. They're not being promoted. You're a thief. You're a robber. Right? There's injustice that you can do something about, you can speak out against. But you don't, especially those who belong to the establishment, the religious establishment. Then you're the Levite or the priest. The idea is this, that we should reflect on this story also contextually and say, God, who am I? But I realize that Jesus is leading us towards something. Because read with me in, 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 as we conclude this from verse 36. When Jesus finished telling the story, he says, which of these three do you think 
proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the neighbors. He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Okay. Jesus is saying, and I want us to reflect this, no matter where or who you are in the story, the question is, well, what does being a neighbor look like? What is the right thing to do then towards those other actors in the story? However, very important distinction that Jesus is making here. Remember the lawyer's question about neighbor? Do you remember it? Who is my neighbor? Do you see what Jesus did there? He's changed the question altogether. Who became a neighbor? Right? Who, who is my neighbor? Who qualifies for me to love them, for me to take care of them, for me to be good to them? Jesus is saying, no, 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 no. Who qualified themselves? Who became a neighbor? Don't ask, who is my neighbor? Ask yourself, how am I going to be a neighbor? Jesus has twisted it around, right? He found values that were warped, and he's leading the other way. Do you see this? And he's saying the whole point, the goal here, is you need to qualify yourself as a neighbor don't look at for those who, are, who you qualify, who, feel, who you feel somehow must meet the standard of becoming my neighbor. Ultimately, this is a comment about Christ himself. Okay, Every parable, every story, every interaction that Jesus had, he was proclaiming himself. So here, the unexpected intervention from an agent who was outside, who comes in and extends mercy, who shows himself to be the ultimate neighbor. This is a comment about Christ. This is what he did. This is what he did. The one who comes from the outside and breaks in, the agent of salvation, he breaks in and he extends mercy. He shows God's kindness. This is, a, this is Christological. It reveals to us the person of Christ. But then it issues this summons to us in our own context, in the marketplace. How should we then, as those who've received God's kindness, behave? We should go out and be neighbors. That's what we should do. That's how we should act in South Africa. That's what our leadership should be about as well. Neighborliness. How do we become good neighbors the way which we have received God's kindness and grace in the person of Jesus Christ? I pray that as we catch up by being gathered in Christ and focusing on Jesus Christ, as we meditate on the things he's already doing in this world, in our field, in the marketplace, in media, it might be helpful to put the list down that we understand that we've been called to lead in a way that rehearses the gospel of Jesus Christ that we have received in the same way that we received God's kindness undeservedly, this is how we are meant to apply ourselves today in this world. It's going to feel countercultural. It's going to feel like we're doing things in opposites. But we will be satisfied because we will be leading with him to the glory of his name. Amen. <laughs>